Good evening everyone and welcome to another of your spooky sessions with me your host Heather Gold. I hope you are all keeping well this Friday evening and you are looking forward to tonight's stories. Well tonight um, I have decided to bring you some ghost stories from Japan. I've been looking into um, Japanese um, folklore and I found um, a nice couple of um, bits of Japanese folklore that fit the ghostly horror genre. So I'm going to read those two short ones for you tonight. And then I'm going to pick up from where we left off last week in Restoration, episode three. So I do hope you're looking forward to that. So I'm going to ask you to please sit back, relax, while I read you these couple of um, entertaining stories from Japan, the land of the rising sun. It is, or is that Iceland? Never mind, I think it's the land of the rising sun. Anyway, all joking apart, I do hope you enjoyed the stories tonight. The Ghastly Tale of Okiku. That's what this is about tonight. So it, everything goes flying. This is the ghastly tale of Okiku. The tale of Okiku and the Ten Plates is one of the most well-known Japanese ghost stories. One that's laden with elements of social commentary and karmic retribution. In the most popular folk version, a servant girl named Okiku worked for the tyrannical samurai Aoyama Tasan. Frustrated by Okiku's repeated rejection of his sexual advances, Aoyama framed Okiku for the loss of a precious plate, one of a set of ten. Terrified and frenzied, Okiku repeatedly counted the remaining plates. Naturally always ending with no more than nine. Still unaware of what was happening, she then unwisely rejected Aoyama's amorous advances again. Incensed, the samurai had the young servant thrown into a well. Aoyama soon suffered due to his comeuppance. Okiko transformed into a vengeful Japanese spirit after death and obsessively recounted the plates every night. When she reached the missing tenth plate, she would shriek hideously in fear and frustration. How the story ends then depends on which version one is reading. In one, Okiku's spirit was appeased by a priest. In another, Oyama was driven mad and committed suicide. In yet another version, Okiku's spirit was finally put to rest after someone shouted, Ten, before she screamed. Now there are some notes attached to this story. And it says, like all other famous Japanese folklore stories, there are several versions of this folktale today. A significantly different version took place at Himeji Castle. And in that version, Okiku was the hapless victim of a political ploy. The part about the ten dishes remains unchanged. Today, there is a well in Himeji Castle said to be the one Okiku was thrown into. Another version, written by Kido Okamoto, d 
depicted Okiku as far less innocent. In that version, she was a servant in love with Aoyama, with the samurai refusing to marry her because of a more profitable marriage proposal. As a test of love, Okiku broke the tenth plate. Okiku's tragic story was supposedly the inspiration for the famous Japanese horror movie series, The Ring. That's very interesting, because I did not know that. Now the next story is called Yuki Honor. And it's the tale of a woman called Yuki Honor and it translates into Snow Woman. That's in English and it refers to a pale demoness who freezes her victims to death with an icy breath. Within Japan, yokai stories involving this awful creature long existed. Today, the most famous story of the Yuki Onna is the rewritten version by a 19th century writer, Lafcadio Hearn. In Hearn's version, two woodcutters, one elderly and one young, had the misfortune of encountering a Yuki Onna while trapped in the woods by a snowstorm. While the older woodcutter was frozen to death by the demoness, the young one, Minokichi, was spared. Before leaving, the Yuki Ona warned Minokichi to never tell anybody about the encounter, and should he do so, she would surely return to kill him. Years later, Minokichi is happily married to a beautiful wife named Oyuki. Not only was Oyuki a caring mother and a devoted wife, she also mysteriously did not age, retaining her youthful looks year after year. One evening, while their children were asleep, Minokichi thoughtlessly revealed his encounter with the Yuki Onna, musing whether it was all a dream or a genuine brush with death. Upon him completing his tale, Oyuki stood up and revealed a true form, that of the Yuki Honor from that fateful evening. After reminding Minokichi about her previous threat, she made as if to kill him, but ultimately she spared his life for the sake of their children. But then she vanished, never to be seen again. Now, the notes that go with this story is the most common illustration of the Yuki Ona is that of a pale but beautiful young woman, one wearing a white, blue or silver kimono. Given her murderous nature, you are unlikely to see the Yuki Ona portrayed in a positive light during your Japanese holiday. However, she often appears in manga, anime and video games. In hobbyist areas like Akihabara, you might also encounter posters or figurines of her. At the snowy landscapes of Hida and Niigata, etc., it's not at all hard to imagine such a fearsome demoness lurking amidst the snow. The Irish writer Lafcadio Hearn is internationally famous for his compilations of traditional Japanese folklore stories. He spent his later life in Japan, married to a Japanese woman. Today, his home and memorial museum are among the top attractions of Matsui City. Hearn is also known as Koizumi Yakumo in Japan. Yakumo is nowadays the Japan Railways 
limited express service that commutes between Matsue and Okayama City. In 1964, Masaki Kobayashi adapted four tales from Hearn's Kwaidan into a horror anthology of the same name. Yuki Ona was one of the tales. So, there you have your Japanese spooky stories for tonight. So how do you think they compare with some of the other stories that I've read to you over the months? Do you think they compare favourably? Or do you think Japan has its own way of expressing horror and the supernatural, the paranormal? Have any of you seen the movie The Ring? Um, I have. And um, I could only watch it the once. I couldn't watch it again. Um, I watched both the Japanese and the American version. To be honest with you, I don't know which one was worse. They both had me spooked, to be quite honest with you. But uh, I was going to say which bit spooks me the most, but I'm not going to spoil it for you just in case you've actually never seen it. So, we've done that now. I'm now going to go on and read you your restoration. It's episode three tonight. Now, where were we last week? Well, last week we saw the return of an old adversary. And we all know him lovingly as Belial. And a piece of the Sanguine Amber had gotten to Fred's toolbox. Of course, obviously Fred didn't know what it was. Um, but then he got this visit from Belial. And he's quite quickly made an enemy of Belial. Um, and he got Timothy to sort of explain who he was. And, but now we left Fred sitting on his bed and hearing taps on his window all night. So... I think we should now go and read episode three and um, let's find out what's happening with Fred this week. I'll just have a little drink first. Oh, appear to have some noisy neighbours tonight. Um, excuse me, could we have the windows closed? We've got noisy neighbours. Sorry about the interruption, guys. I've, um, we've got some rather noisy neighbours out tonight and I just um, need my son to quickly close the windows because it's been a bit warm today. But as the neighbours are being particularly noisy... I think we'll close them out for the night. That's all action in this house, isn't it? I could have told you there were noisy ghosts, but I'm afraid I can't get away with that. Thank you very much, son. Mm -hmm. That was my son. He's a bit camera shy. Right, let's get on then, shall we? Morning came, and I haven't put the shotgun down yet. Still sitting at the end of the bed and checking the windows. It seemed like the tapping stopped sometime around dawn. I hear my wife's alarm clock go off, and the sounds of her rousing from her sleep. Morning, honey, she mumbles, brunette hair a mess of Frizz and tangles. A bit like mine. Morning. I say simply. Making sure she's okay. 
she gets out of bed and heads to the bathroom. I hear the kids' alarms go off next and my boys are heard roughhousing in their bedroom. My wife, Sandy, comes out of the bathroom, toothbrush in hand, and is about to motion for me to go and contain the wild animals that are my 15 and 13 year old boys. She stops when she spots the shotgun in my hand. She quickly spits out our toothpaste. Fred, why the fuck are you holding a shotgun? She looks up at me and down with her soft brown eyes. Are those the clothes you had on when you came home yesterday? Honey, I got visited by a guy who is probably not human in the least. And he threatened the family if I don't return a red blade-like object that came from some mysterious excavation site. Well, that's the most truthful thing I want to say to her. It also sounds batshit insane, and the more I play the sentence over and over in my head, the more I question my own sanity. Fred? Sandy pokes my shoulder. Apparently I was staring off into space, while trying to think up a logical explanation to a completely rational question. Uh, um, someone was on the lawn last night and was banging on the door and wouldn't go away until I got the shotgun. Sandy cocks her hip and shoots me one of those emasculating wife stares. So rather than call the cops, you reach for the shotgun? I cocked the shotgun and clear the ammo out before heading back down to the closet to put it and the shells back. I just wasn't sure if it was a prowler or kids. Sandy pokes her head out of the bedroom. Speaking of, Colin, Trevor, shake a leg. I close the closet and see my boys bounding down the steps in various states of dress dragging their backpacks and heading to the table. They start fighting over cereal and I quickly resolve it before a good scolding and getting them prepped for the bus. They finish up and are soon out of the door with coats and sneakers on. My wife follows next, wearing a robe. Don't you have that job today? I nod, looking at the time. Yeah, you're right. They get motivated. I do. And I head out the door, give the wife a kiss and I'm heading down back to the site, making sure my toolbox is with me. Same as the first morning, Timothy is there at the gate. He undoes the chain and we all head into the mansion again. He props the doors open and the crew heads in. I get the business squared away first, Chavez and Pete on the scissor lift to finish a few touches on the walls while Bob and Mike get to the mixing and quick set and the filling of the gash on the floor. They also work on making sure there's a barrier between the gash and the rest of the work area so we can work on the rest of the flooring. During this prep work, I notice Mike eyeing the doorway. Mike, you taking in the scenery? Mike points to the roof of the outside. Steepled. He leans into the doorway. Um, he shines a light up to the ceiling. Flat. I look to Mike. Attic. Mike pulls out a laser measurer. Steeple peak is 53 feet. He leans in. Ceiling is 50 feet. He leans out again. Low point steeple is 44 feet. And he leans back in. Flat ceiling is 50 feet. I grumble a bit. Our last day here might get the job done. The thing's probably on the fritz. 
My eyes aren't on the fritz, Fred. Damn your eyes. I see Bob looking at the same thing as Mike. Bob, do something. Bob seems startled but manages to compose himself and get back to setting up his tools. I walk past the crew as they prep and pop open my toolbox. I find the strange object or artefact or whatever it is out my toolbox and head towards Timothy. Timothy is observing Chavez and Pete when he spots me coming. This wound up in my toolbox, I say, holding the object out in front of me. Timothy looks it over without touching it. Then he looks to me after a solid minute. This came from here? I nod. From inside that dash on the floor. Timothy holds his right hand over the thing for a moment. Then he starts guiding his hand back and forth over it slowly. I have no clue what he's doing. I'm about to ask. But as I look up, I notice his eyes seem to be a more intense blue than they were before, specifically his right eye. Timothy stops suddenly and just grabs the thing with his right hand and pulls it hard out of my grip. Thanks for returning this. He turns it over in his hand again. His eyes seem to be a normal shade of blue again. It's a very rare find. Well, that's what your associates said. I said I was hoping to fish for some info. If this Belial guy knows Timothy, then Timothy should know him. Associate? He looks at me quizzically. I nod. Yeah, tall guy. Kind of yellow eyes. Way too perfect teeth. Timothy seems completely confused. I'm afraid I don't know anybody like that. All my associates are here. I figured it was time to stop trying to get him to spill the beans and just come out and say it. Listen, the guy shows up last night, tells me he wants that thing, and then tells me his name is Belial and you know him. Timothy's face goes slightly pale. You certainly said Belial. I just nod. Timothy looks to the object and then walks to the doors. Sorry for this, but I hope you have everything you need inside. And he shuts the doors. I'm a bit downfounded by this point. I thought you said you were concerned about the ventilation. Timothy just walks right past me and towards the barricade. Ventilation is the least of your worries at this moment. I turn around and the entire crew is dead silent. Not sure what to do as we hear some banging, a few doors closing, and then some rustling past the barricade. I just come out and say it. We have this one last day to get the floor cleaned. Get that gash and the smaller scrapes and holes plugged. Move it, now, and then we can get the fuck out of here. The crew seems pretty much on board and the sounds of work soon overpower anything else. Almost half an hour since Timothy left, I suddenly feel a hand on my shoulder and I spin around out of sheer instinct. A small round bottle is shoved into my hands. That's for you, Timothy says before he hands the bottles to the rest of the crew. I look and I see it's just a small round glass bottle with a long spout at the top and a cap. Timothy doesn't have the object in question any longer, and now he heads towards the barrier again. As he passes me, I grab him. I need at least a what the fuck is this explanation, and who the fuck is that for this Belial guy? I glare at him. That, Timothy says, as he points to the bottle, is for protection from Belial. That's half my questions, Tim. Timothy. <sighs> Who the fuck is Belial? 
I reiterate. He looks up to the angelic statue, and I turn to see the large statue of St. Dinah. He's her opposite. Before he can elaborate, he's back behind the barrier. Just finish up today and get the fuck out is all I can think of. I grab the pressure washer and start working alongside my guys to get things rolling. It's the end of the day and it's clean-up time. Timothy opens the doors and checks outside for something and we all start loading up the trucks. Timothy looks around, seemingly satisfied. This is quite excellent work, Fred. Thank you. I nod, hoping we can finish up shortly. The gash in the floor is fully repaired. It'll take a full 24 hours to cure, but you can walk across it without much issue. We cleaned up the main hall here, got the walls, statues, ceilings, and of course, the flooring squared away. And the amphitheatre, Chavez says as he and Pete seem to be pulling equipment from the left side of the room. Pete's face is pretty pale as he walks by, but I stop them regardless. Amphitheatre? Pete just looks at me and shakes his head. I sigh. Chavez, that wasn't in the order. Timothy chimes in. How did you get into the amphitheatre? I'm never going to get out of this place, am I? So close and yet so far. Chavez happily shows us down the left-hand side of the hall and clicks on the lights. A pair of massive 50-foot double doors stand right in front of us and reach from floor to ceiling. The ceiling looks like it tapers into a dome. It's not so much that it's there's a pair of 50-foot wide tall double doors right in front of me that are almost 20 feet wide. It's what on the damn things above is me. Carved into the marble are pictures of armour-clad angels with feathery wings. Under their feet are various horrible-looking creatures. A few of the angels stand over the said defeated creatures with spears shoved in them. Others are in the process of smiting them. As the doors go up, the carvings get weirder. Not just feathery angels, but those other winged humanoid things. They look like lizards with wings. Stranger still is at the very top of these doors is a huge lizard-like feature. Massive bat-like wings spread out, holding a shield with a cross on it and a huge spear. It's hard to see fully, but the doors seem to meet, or at least have to meet in the middle, where his face would be. If you could call it a face, it was mostly a lizard head with horns over a long snake-like neck. Chavez takes a knee in front of the doors and starts reciting God's Prayer. One of them clicks open. Voice activated doors? I ask, hoping there's some kind of rational explanation and wondering why we haven't left yet. Chavez gets up and opens the door wide enough to walk in. He drags one of the lamps and powers it up, motioning for the rest of us to come in. We found this door here and Pete and I cleaned it up. It was easier than the rest. The floor here is different. I look down and thank God there's a seam. I finally find a seam in this place. But the seam is from marble to granite. And as I walk in, it's pretty clear that, oddly, everything is made of granite in this room. Stacking up into the darkness so high, I couldn't even tell, were chairs. These chairs were large stone chairs. They all culminated around a central chair. A chair is an understatement. This was more of a throne. 
The chairs are all surrounded. The stage. We found ourselves in a huge crescent. I turned to Timothy, whose gaze was transfixed on, transfixed on the central throne. That far away look in his eyes again. Chavez was again the only one to speak. Saint Dinah? Timothy nods and leaves the room. I didn't know those doors opened. Thank you, Chavez. I click the lights off and pull the lights out, making sure everyone is out now of the perfectly dark room. Good work, guys. Now let's get packed. I'm now overly invested in getting out of here as fast as possible. Pete leans over to me, whispering. The door outside and the amphitheatre doors are on the same wall. But there's no structure on the outside that could fit that. I notice this as well as I walk outside the mansion and then back inside. Pete? Yeah? Don't think about it. Pete just frowns at me. I guess that's the best bet. I give a final examination of the place before we kill the last of the lights. And I do have to say the place is looking nice. The white marble floor is polished to the point where I can see my reflection. The gash is sealed up nice and neat and it just looks like a vein in the marble. Everything is looking perfect inside. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. I give a little nod to St. Dinah and that statue and head to the door as the lights are taken down. I do my head count and once again, I'm short of a Honduran. I walk back inside and find Chavez kneeling in front of the statue of St. Dinah. Only the light from the setting sun reflecting off the floor to light the room softly. Chavez, end of the day, let's go. I'm staying, he says simply. And also the bottle at Timothy handed him is empty. Did you drink that? I said a bit shocked. Do you even know what's in that, Chavez? God's bless him. Chavez stands up and he just looks, for the lack of a better word, happy. Like a man without a care in the world. I'm not leaving you here, Chavez. The client isn't going to let you hanging round here. Timothy chimes in, walking back from behind the barrier again. Actually, Chavez agreed to assist me in a few things going forward. I turn to look at Timothy. You ever think I might not want to lose a member of my crew? Chavez speaks up. Mr. Fred, it's okay. I want to stay here. I want to help St. Timothy interrupts. He volunteered. It's hard to say no to him. I give Chavez a look. He just smiles and extends his hand. It's been nice working with you, Fred. I ignore it. Get your head on straight. I'm your ride. I'm staying, Fred. I turn and shout. Chavez, I'm not staying here any longer, OK? I'm out. Done. Finished. I stop for a second. I didn't say finished. I said finito. But for some reason, it came out as English. I'm 100% done with this place, OK? I'm out. Job's done. You want to stay? Enjoy. I head towards my truck, look to my toolbox, ensure nothing else is there that shouldn't be, close it, and out I go. As I head out of the doors, Timothy starts to close them behind us, him and Chavez still inside. Timothy looks to me before he closes the doors. The remainder of your payment is in the truck. Everything we discuss, I can't fully express my gratitude. 
He shuts the doors and we load up. I check the truck and there's an envelope with the second half of the payment. I'm pretty shocked and I count the bills a few times. I'm up a good ten grand. I've heard of getting a tip, but this was a bit overkill. I know one pair of kids whose college fund is going to be in a good place after all of this. At home, I'm doing the husband thing and cleaning up the dishes from the wife's dinner. Sandy and the boys are asleep, and that's when I hear a crash in the garage. I run to the closet, grab the shotgun, and fill it with a few shells before I rush in. I'm kind of expecting him at this point. My toolbox and all the tools are stream about all over the floor. I see my garage door open slightly and suddenly something small and almost glass-like hits me in the face. I look down to see what looks like a chunk of the object that was in my toolbox about the size of a half dollar land on the floor. That is but a pittance, Red Fred. I turn to the voice and I see glowing yellow eyes in the darkness. Not nearly what I need. I pull the gun to go to shoot, but I feel a tug against my entire body as if someone grabbed onto my sweatshirt from the front and pulled it down forward. I barely take a step forward, but it's enough to get me to the point point the gun down at the floor. I look up as Belial's hand is dropping from being in midair, steam rising off the black rings on his fingers. Weak. Not this week, though. Another hissing laugh. He offered you protection. How noble. Before I can aim, a tool shoots off my workbench and smacks at the shotgun, which lands a few feet from me. I lunge for it, but it suddenly leaps off the floor and into Belial's hand. Belial takes the shotgun and places it against his shoulder, looking down on me. As if a little bauble could do anything against me. I try to get up, but he places his foot on my shoulder. I can't move. You've done something very foolish, Red Fred. He soon is crouching down on his haunches over me. You've hidden the only thing that can help me move up from a puppeteer to God. The shotgun barrel now slides under my chin as I see Belial's face illuminated by the light coming from the doorway. But there's hope for you yet. I'm shaking at this point, as I'm not sure how the tables turn so fast. You can fix your mistake, and in return, I'll spare you and your family's lives. His voice starts to wheeze, but not as much as it did before. He seems somehow stronger. Despite how I look, I've done quite a bit to exist in this world. Possessions normally a lesser demon's game. But the discovery of that sanguine amber, he cocks the shotgun. I couldn't resist. I'm sweating and slowly try to get back to my feet. I'm on my hands and knees by the time I feel the barrel at the back of my head. Now, this is your next course of action. You will leave here, right away, and retrieve for me the sanguine amber you found. You will bring it back here and give it to me. In return, you'll be at my side rather than in my path. I swear I can hear his grin somehow. Nod if you understand. I nod. What else could I do? If you do not bring me the amber, if you do not return home, or if you somehow reach out to Timothy or for aid, 
I will go upstairs and I will make your children watch as I violate your wife in every way you can and cannot imagine. I clench my fists. If you lay a hand on her, I'll... You're what, mortal? <clears throat> I hear the safety slide off. Bleed on me. I relax, and I hear the safety slide back as the gong clatters to the floor. You're on the clock, Freddy. I look up, and the garage is clean. The door isn't open. There isn't even a sign that I've dropped the shotgun as it's sitting neatly on my workbench. I get to my feet, shaking, <clears throat> and turn to see a figure right behind me, causing me to shout in fear. Sandy is behind me. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Sandy is behind me and she punches me in the shoulder. Jesus, it's just me. Why are you so jumpy, Fred? What's going on? I rub my shoulder where she nailed me and I tried to figure out how best to protect one's family from someone who's clearly not from this world. That's when I remember what Timothy handed me at the work site. I rushed to the closet to find my coat. Were you on the phone? I thought I heard you talk to someone, said Sandy. I pulled the bottle out my coat and turned to her, pressing the bottle into her hands. Sandy, I know this is going to sound batshit nuts, but I need you to drink this and share it with the boys, okay? They're asleep, Fred, Sandy says curtly. She looks at the bottle and raises an eyebrow. This isn't some random point where you poison us all and run off to Malibu with some bimbo, is it? I grab her by the shoulders, looking her dead in the eye. I'm asking you to trust me. Just drink half the bottle. Spit the rest with the kids, okay? I need you to do that for me right now. Just drink half. Sandy's clearly worried now, but she undoes the cap on the bottle. Okay, Fred, okay. Calm down. She takes a swig, and then another, until the bottle is half empty. And she caps it. So I drank it. What? Well, she trails off and suddenly closes her eyes, opening them again and looking right into my eyes. Oh, wow, that's probably the best water I ever drank. I nod. Make sure you give it to the boys, okay? I left something at the work site. I need to get it. Sandy just nods. I love you, Fred. I like over her shoulders. I love you too. Just make sure the kids drink that and keep the doors locked, okay? You don't let anyone inside. Sandy just nods again. Okay, Fred. Be careful. She walks up the stairs and waves, smiling serenely as I rush out the door, lock it, and make my way back to the truck. In retrospect, I should have kissed her. I was driving swiftly, fast enough to be a little worried, but not fast enough to get pulled over. I got to the gate of the work site in roughly half an hour, which is a pretty good time from my house. I saw the gate wasn't chained up anymore, which seemed odd, because Timothy had to undo that chain every time. Did he never leave the mansion after they closed the doors? I drove down the driveway and hit my lights, knowing it might be too dark in that main hallway, and ran to the doors. Timothy, open up! I slammed my fist into the door. Damn it, Timothy, open the damn door! I looked to see there's no padlock on the door and jostle the old doorknob, swinging the doors open. Chavez, Timothy! I shout into the empty room 
expecting an echo, but I hear no such sound. I'm hit with a musty scent, the smell of rotting wood and mildewed fabric. I look around, pulling out a flashlight. The boards are letting light in from the front. There are no statues, no marble floor, just a set of collapsed staircases and a rotting subfloor with a few ripped and torn rugs and graffiti. I take a step outside just to confirm it's the same place and then peek back inside. The barricades are gone, the marble ceilings, the walls, the seamless floor. It's as if it was never there. I run through the ruins of this ancient mansion. The mansion is mundane, old, too ruined to fix. Should be knocked down. I try a door or two, each opening to a rotting room after a rotting room. I eventually became overwhelmed with the fungus in the air and I stumbled out of the door, falling to my knees near my car. And as I tried to catch my breath, I tried to figure out what the hell was going on. I turned to look at the old mansion behind me and all I could think of was one thing. The site we were working on was gone or was never here in the first place. And the amber was gone with it. So there you have the end of episode three, my friends. A bit more action this week and the tensions building up. And what's happened? Where's the marble walls? Where are the statues? The amphitheatre? Where have they all gone? And where's Timothy and Chavez gone? And what's Fred going to do now? Because if he can't get the sanguine amber, Belial. Well, we know what Belial's planning to do. And if we know Belial, he's a demon of his word. Because we know him of old, don't we? So, please let me know what you think of this. Because it's great to get your feedback. And also, please let me know what you thought of your stories in the beginning. You know, just let me know if you enjoyed both your stories tonight. Well, my friends, we've come to the end of another spooky session. And I do hope you've had a pleasant evening spending this little bit of time with me here in the Haven. I've thoroughly enjoyed the stories tonight. I just hope you have too. I want to wish you the happiest weekend that you can possibly have. And it's, I want to thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for watching me and for listening to the stories. And I just want to say I love you. Do hope you have a great weekend. And I will see you all again very, very soon. So until then, take care. And bye-bye for now. Bye-bye for now. And I've remembered this week. And I would also like to wish you a very good night.
Good night.